Sleep. How many of you got enough sleep last night? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. I'd say maybe about 10% of those that were brave enough to raise their hands got enough sleep. Many of us are not getting enough sleep. Experts tell us that the average healthy human being needs somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep. So let me ask you again, how many of you are on a regular basis, you don't need to raise your hand, getting seven to nine hours of good sleep? Recent, recent surveys tell us that people are only sleeping on average about 5.7 hours per night, which fars falls way short of the required minimum for optimum health. And apparently, in my reading, it's women under the age of 50 who especially struggle to get enough sleep with all the responsibilities and things that are weighing upon their shoulders. So if you struggle with getting seven hours of good sleep in each night, you may know some of the consequences. Let me just share a few with you. Symptoms of sleeplessness. First of all, this is the obvious one, uh, fatigue, fatigue, feeling lethargic or drowsy throughout the day. Some of you may be feeling that after a long day of picnicking and fun yesterday. Uh, perhaps mood changes will be evident to you or those around you. Feeling irritable, even depressed, anxious, stressed, or possibly paranoid. Cognitive issues, difficulty concentrating, Remembering things, processing information, physical issues like poor balance and coordination or reduced physical stamina and strength, social issues, maybe uh, not having a really great EQ, emotional quotient, being able to read people's emotions and reactions, or feeling a little bit frustrated, cranky, or worried in some social situations. Uh, some, and I've noticed this in my life, when I'm not getting enough sleep experience, weight gain. Sleep deprivation can lead to weight gain because it increases a hormone called ghrelin, which increases appetite and decreases the hormone leptin, which makes you feel less full overall. And finally, psychosis. Lack of sleep can produce psychotic symptoms such as paranoia, bizarre delusions, and even hallucinations. And these things are all too real. Let me tell you, if you're struggling with any of these symptoms, lack of sleep is probably part of the reason. Now, I'm not here as a sleep doctor. I did recently visit the Center for Sleep Medicine in Glenview for some issues and help with my own sleep situation. But today I want to talk to you as God's people, as God's children, about how the truth of God's word can help you rest assured and sleep secure. By the way, the other day I heard somebody who was uh, bragging to their co-workers, this was a young parent. Maybe some of you remember what it was like to be parents of young children that don't sleep very much, and that means young parents often don't sleep. The young parents said, I finally got eight hours of sleep, and the co-worker got excited and said, wow, that's great. Yeah, it took me three days, but whatever. Eight hours in three days, not enough. Another man said, insomnia is terrible, but on the plus side, only three more sleeps until Christmas. All right, all right. How about this one? Here's one for you. It's a little joke. What do you call it when a kid is fighting going to sleep? Have you ever had that little child? Maybe you're babysitting. Maybe you're watching someone else's kid. Maybe it's your own kid. What do you call it when a child is fighting going to sleep? Anybody have a guess? Okay, get ready for this. It's, it's kind of bad. Resisting arrest. <laughs> Resisting arrest. <laughs> when a child is fighting, going to sleep. As we continue our series in the Psalms of David to the Choir Master, we come to Psalm 4, a beautiful hymn written to be sung congregationally with the accompaniment of stringed instruments. Many of you Psalm 4 as an evening psalm, a psalm for preparing to sleep or while one is lying in bed, possibly unable to sleep, tossing and turning with thoughts and imaginations going through their head. Some even see Psalm 4 as the evening song in companionship to Psalm 3, which could be a morning song. Both of them are written against the backdrop 
a hostile enemy attacks and arrogant, hurtful accusations. In fact, Psalm 3 even says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So if you know about the story of David and Absalom, his son, you'll know this was probably the most difficult period in David's entire life. It's a very personal psalm of David, written during the vulnerability of a very difficult time. But the fact that it says at, in the title, Psalm 4 and verse 1, right before that verse, to the choir master with string instruments, the Psalm of David, the fact that it's addressed to the choir master tells us that this personal, vulnerable prayer of David is meant for God's people. And it's meant for each one of us as the faithful chosen ones of the Lord to pray to God in the evening, especially when sleep is coming to us difficulty. It's our confident hymn of praise that we too can sing and repeat throughout the watches of the night. So if I could title it, I would call Psalm 4, In Peace I Lie Down. And I believe that Psalm 4 helps anxious insomniacs move from tossing and turning to thinking and trusting. And by insomniacs, of course, I mean not so much a medical condition, but rather all of us when we have difficulty when we're sleeping. Let's move from listening to the clock chime the quarters or the halves through the night to hearing God's gracious promise that everything is going to be all right. So let's take a closer look. Psalm 4 and verse 1 says, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. So here we see, first of all, that in the night of distress, we can pray with confidence. And if you're visiting with us today, you might not realize that on the back of the bulletin, there are some notes you can fill in if you would like that go along with the message. Uh, there should be a pen there near you somewhere. And also at the bottom of the bulletin are some discussion group questions that can guide you as you think through the message later on and throughout the day. So in the night of distress, we can pray with confidence. Answer me, David says, O oh God of my righteousness. Boy, one thing that I have noticed in my own prayer life is that how I address God in my prayer is so important. Sometimes when we pray, maybe you notice this in your own life, we can just address God sort of flippantly, like you always say, gracious Heavenly Father. But you don't actually think about what it means that God is gracious, or that He is our Father, or in Heaven. So it's important to think about how we address God, and it's also appropriate sometimes to creatively address God in different ways. And so David here addresses God in a different way. He calls him God of my righteousness. Now, as a Christian, we may think of God as the source of righteousness by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But in the context of the song, it's saying that God is the one who is righteous and he is the upholder of justice. And the psalm is written against the backdrop of accusations, false accusations by others, and a person going through a very difficult time with their enemies attacking them without just cause. And so he's addressing God as the God of my righteousness. It doesn't matter what everyone else says about you. What matters is what God knows to be true of you. He is the upholder of justice. He's the one who gives us relief. David says, when I was in distress. The Hebrew word for distress there means to be backed into a corner. You ever feel like you backed into a corner, maybe a situation at work? Yes. Maybe uh, a family member yes. has said some things about you that are not true or insinuated some things about your actions and your motives which were not accurate, and you feel like you're, you're backed into a corner. What does that mean? It means there's nowhere to turn, there's nowhere to go. And so fight or flight sometimes can kick in. And if you're back into a corner, flight might not be an option. So then you might kind of put your fists up and want to fight. And what we see here in Psalm 4 is that 
That's not what God calls his people to do. There's a better option when we feel back into a corner. And that better option is if you're back into a corner and you can't turn to the right or to the left, where can you turn? You can turn to God. You can look up in prayer. And you can turn to the Lord who is your strong deliverer. Be gracious to me. Hear my prayer, O God. Second of all, we see in these verses that in the echoes of accusation, we can counter with truthfulness. In the echoes of accusation, we can counter with truthfulness. I don't know about you, but throughout the watches of the night, if I'm laying in bed and it's difficult to sleep, or sometimes as is the case for me, I'll go to bed, I'll go right to sleep because I'm exhausted, but then a little while later, we've got a couple puppy dogs at our house, and one of them will wake me up or have to go outside or something, and then I can't go back to sleep. And it's in those moments in the middle of the night when I'm lying in bed and I can't sleep that all kinds of images and voices start bouncing around inside my head. And some of those can be the accusations that others have made. Oftentimes, there's not even a direct accusation against you or against your character, but rather it's something someone said and you replay it over and over again. And the more you replay it, the more you begin to think that what they said was rude, that it was angry, that it was unjust. Many times the person didn't mean anything by it. It was just a silly throwaway comment. But we replay it over and over again, and we squeeze it, and we begin to get all that junk from it. And those echoes of accusation can bounce around our head especially throughout the watches of the night. We can counter them with truthfulness. And so in verses 2 and 3, David transitions from praying to God to addressing the accusers. It'd be like in the middle of the night, you've got all these accusations bouncing around your head, and you address the people and the faces that come to mind, saying, O oh, men... How long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Salah. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Maybe the accusers are saying things like, who are you going to turn to now? Who's going to help you now? Who's going to deliver you now? And David says, in the face of lies, in the face of shaming, I know the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We are children of the one true king. God has set us apart for himself. The Lord hears when we call. And so when those accusa accusations are echoing around your head, you can counter with the truthfulness of God's word. That's why it's so important that we're in the word, that we're in prayer. You know, we're reading our daily bread. We're reading our passage of scripture each day. We're meditating upon God and the truth. You know, if you spend eight hours a day watching TV and eight minutes reading the scriptures, which one's going to have a bigger impact on your life? Right, we we got to flip the script on how we often process information. We need to be spending more time in God's word, more time in prayer, more time meditating, less time being brainwashed by the things that come through our, our the internet to our phones, the things that come through the airwaves to our radios and to our TVs. We need to have our minds washed by the truth of God's word. And that's the way to counter the echoes of accusation. Third, we see in these verses, we can lie down in peace. In the imaging of revenge, we can surrender to providence. I, I love how honest David is here. We see the progression from his initial prayer to God, God of his righteousness, to addressing the accusations of his enemies. And this also happens to me in the middle of the night when I can't sleep. Maybe it happens to you too. Do you ever replay those conversations and imagine what you should have said or what you could have said to that other person. Yes. Oh, if I had only had my druthers, I would have said this, and that would have really chopped them off at the knee. Yeah. 
I would have gotten them then. Yeah. And we replay those things, and then we're full of regret that we didn't say those things. So what does it say in verse 4? Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. So when those images of revenge, whether it be spoken or even in this case, David seems to refer to uh, images of violent revenge against enemies, we can surrender to providence that God is in control. As it says in the scriptures, Proverbs 20, do not say I will repay evil, wait for the Lord and he will deliver you. That's what it means to surrender to providence to wait for the Lord and his deliverance. Romans 12 says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So never, beloved, avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. That's what it means to surrender to providence and to God's control. Notice the text says, Be angry and do not sin. Paul quotes from this in Ephesians chapter 4, a passage talking about harmony and peacefulness and even forgiveness. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So anger that we hold on to, that we don't deal with right away, can become a way for the devil to stick his foot in the door of our heart, so to speak, and sort of wiggle his way in. I didn't grow up in the Middle East or amongst Bedouins, but I'm told there's a proverb of Bedouins in the Middle East that goes something like this. Once the camel gets his nose in, dot, 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 the next thing you know, the whole camel's in the tent. So don't let the camel get his nose in the tent. Don't let the devil get his foot in the door, so to speak. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. That means as much as it is up to you to take the most appropriate and immediate action to deal with misunderstanding to deal with those feelings of anger. And as you are angry, anger itself, true or false, don't raise your hand, I don't want to embarrass anybody, just think in your mind, true or false, anger is sin. Some of you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, it's a sin to be angry. And the reason why you think that is because you've only ever seen unholy, destructive anger expressed. But Jesus got angry on occasions recorded in the Gospels. Jesus was angry, always in justice and in righteousness. Jesus raised his voice when wrongs were committed, especially when people uh, were harmed. And so it's not a sin to be angry. In fact, it's a very powerful emotion for good. It can also be a powerful emotion for evil. And so that's why we have to be very careful with are anger. Anger is a very powerful emotion for good. I remember growing up in the 1980s and we would see bumper stickers on all, every other car it seemed like. M-A-D-D. -D. You remember what that stands for? How many of you were around back then? What's it stand for? Mothers, mothers Against Drunk Driving. So these mothers, these wonderful, <laughs> nice mothers were angry. They were mad. Why? Because drunk drivers were causing accidents and injuring, impairing, maiming, even killing their children. And there weren't any laws in the books to hold them responsible or to keep them from doing it again. And so they developed MADD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. We see that their, their anger was a powerful force for good. Of course, most of us have experienced anger as a powerful force for not construction, but destruction, not good, but evil. And so it's important that we distinguish anger that's sinful from anger that can be good and powerful. The idea here in verse 4 of Psalm 4 is do not give way to foolish impulse. Do not give way to foolish impulse. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder 
in your own hearts, on your beds. Be silent. In other words, be mindful. Think before you speak. Sleep on it. So in Ephesians 4, the idea is to take care of the matter right away, just like Jesus says in Matthew 5. Here the idea is, if you're planning to speak a harsh word, or if you're planning to send that nasty email, or if you're planning to get revenge in some way against somebody, maybe sleep on it for the night, and the next morning things will be a little clearer to you. By the way, when it comes to responding to harsh words, have you ever heard the acronym T-H-I-N-K? Think before you speak. T-H-I-N-K, it could be helpful for some of us. Ask yourself these five questions. T, is it true? The thing I'm about to say, is it true? H, is it helpful? Is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? Encouraging? Does it inspire good actions? And is it necessary? Is it really necessary? And K, my favorite, is it kind? Is it kind? Is it true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, kind? And if you can't pass the think test, then I would encourage you to press pause on whatever it is you're planning on saying or doing in response to the other. So in the imaging of revenge, we can surrender to providence. By the way, verse 5, Psalm 4 says, Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Earlier, Rick mentioned Hebrews 13, 5 as one of his favorite Bible verses. I'm reminded here of Hebrews 13, verse 15. Through him, Jesus Christ, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. These are the sacrifices that please the Lord. And again, the scripture says, trust in the Lord. Remember what the word of God says. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Our trust is in the Lord. Number four here in Psalm 4. We can lie down in peace in the middle of the night. You're tossing and turning. How do you turn that tossing and turning to thanksgiving and to trusting in the Lord? In the imaginings of envy, we can perceive with correctness. So when we're tossing and turning, sometimes accusations are echoing in our head. Sometimes we're imagining revenge. But sometimes we're imagining pictures of envy. Oh, they've got it so wonderful. Oh, they have so much more than I have. Oh, their life is so perfect. And we begin to think along those ways, and those thoughts can keep us up at night. Verses 6 and 7, I believe, are a corrective here. It says in verse 6, there are many who say, who will show us some good? The correct response is to pray to the Lord, lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. Verse 7, you will put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. What does it mean here to think correctly, to perceive correctly when images of envy come into our minds and the watches of the night? It means to realize what we truly have in the Lord. You've put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. The fact that God has lifted up the light of his face upon us to see him, to have a right relationship with him, to be granted through Jesus access into the very presence of the one true God. This is the greatest joy, the greatest blessing of all. Grain and wine abounding. That's an ancient Near East way of saying wealth and material pleasures. And so what we see here is a contrast of inward joy versus outward joy. Or as I sometimes like to describe it, joy versus happiness. Christian joy is a set state of mind and contentment in the blessings of God which can never be taken away. 
Christian joy is what I have as a co-heir with Christ Jesus. On the other hand is worldly happiness. Worldly happiness goes up and down like a roller coaster at Six Flags Great America. One second you can be riding high, the next second you're crashing down. And you're up and down just like the temperatures in Chicago. One minute is hot and humid, the next minute is cold and dry. You get the point, right? We don't need to think about those cold days that are not too far around the corner. Uh, but we're up and down. And that's what happiness is. When the grain barns are full, when the wine vats are overflowing, we're happy. But when they're not, we're sad. But the inward joy of the Lord can never be taken away. I love Nehemiah 8, the context there, the reading of the law. The people are weeping as the law is read. Ezra and Nehemiah didn't tell them, do not weep. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Say that with me. The joy of the Lord is your strength. My strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. All the days of the afflicted are evil, says Proverbs 15, verse 15. But the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Better is a dinner of cilantro and parsley. That's all you get on your plate. That's a better dinner than a big barbecue with a fattened ox. When you've got love on the one hand and hatred on the other hand. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is and a fattened ox and hatred with it. The love and joy of the Lord is so much better than anything this world has to offer. And finally, the fifth thing we see here in Psalm 5, Psalm 4 rather, about dwelling peacefully, resting securely, lying down in peace at night. In the midst of the night, we can rest in peacefulness and sleep in secureness. Why? Because God is with us. Rick, what does Hebrews 13, 5 say? I, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. In peace, David says, Psalm 4, verse 8, in peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. The idea of dwelling in safety is of being unafraid. Unafraid. Because God is with us. He surrounds us with his love. Psalm 127 reminds us, it's in vain that we rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. I don't know how many of you have quoted that verse back to God when you can't go to sleep at night. I know I have before. And I got to tell you, there's been times where I kind of bitterly said to God, God, he gives to his beloved sleep. How about a little sleep? He gives to his beloved sleep. And there's been times where that's the last thing I remember until the next morning. Hold God to his word. Repeat to him his promises in your prayers. Unless the Lord builds the house. Those who build it labor in vain, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. God is watching, and because God is watching, you can sleep. Because God is with you, you can rest secure. Whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Proverbs 1.33, Psalm 121.4, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And finally, we conclude on this Labor Day weekend with the words of Jesus, some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture, a gracious invitation from our Lord to rest. Doesn't that sound good? Rest. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light.
Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you say, wait a minute. Nothing about following Jesus is easy. That's true. That's true. He said, take up your cross and follow me. It's not easy. But when you're yoked to Jesus, when you're pulling the load of discipleship and Jesus is pulling it along with you, guess who's pulling all the weights? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. rest. It's very likely that some of you may be here today and you are heavy laden with shame and with guilt and with sin. In fact, sometimes what brings somebody to church on a Sunday like this is a sense of I've done bad things and I have to do religious things to overwhelm and overcome the bad things that I've done in my life. The scripture tells us that all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so we were created to have a right relationship with God, planned for his pleasure, but sin, shame, guilt separates us from God. And we feel that separation. And so we try to overcome the gap. And that's maybe why some of us, maybe why some of us are so weary and so tired and we've even been tempted to give up on God because we think no matter how hard I try, I can't cross the chasm between sinful me and a holy, righteous God. We've tried good works, we've tried religious acts, we've tried keeping all the sacraments, maybe you've tried the noble eightfold path of Buddhism, maybe you try the five pillars of Islam. We try all these different things to overcome the gap between sinful us and holy God, and we just get fed up because we're not making any progress. What we have to realize is that there's nothing we can do. Tanya alluded to this earlier as we were singing our song, It's All Because of Mercy. There's nothing that we can do. Every world religion and philosophy says you got to do this, you got to think that, you got to be this, you got to do this. And when you do all the right things, then you can close the gap between you and God. But biblical Christianity is different because it acknowledges there's nothing we can do to close the gap between sinful us and holy God. The wages of sin is death, separation. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so there's nothing we can do that bridge the gap because we are sinful. But guess what? God is love. And he sent his son Jesus to be the bridge across the great divide so that you and I, not by good works, but by trusting in Jesus, transferring our trust to Jesus Christ, can receive this salvation, receive this forgiveness, and we can stand secure, we can rest secure, and we who are weary and heavy laden on this Labor Day weekend can find rest in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for the rest that you promised and that can be ours in Jesus Christ. I pray that each person present today or watching online will experience that rest, that blessed rest of trusting in Jesus and relying fully in him. And for those of us who do trust and rest in Jesus, we look forward to the heavenly rest and reward that is to come through Jesus Christ our Lord. And yet we also, God, we want to sleep soundly and securely now. In the watches of the night, remind us, Lord, of your love. Remind us of your provision. Remind us of the confidence and the truth and the providence and the correctness and the secureness of your promise to us. Because always and forever, your presence is your promise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to invite our uh, deacons uh, to come forward now as we prepare for communion. I want to remind you that as we celebrate communion, the bread and the cup, this is the time for us to 
focus and fix our minds upon Jesus, our sufficient Savior, and really